dotted throughout Poland, there were hundreds, and I mean hundreds of extermination camps, and these were small camps where the trains that brought the prisoners, you lasted about a month. And 15,000 Czech and Slovak children died in concentration camps. I was born in Prague, but uh, as a family, we lived in a small village. My own mother died when I was three years old, and uh, eventually my father remarried and um, my stepmother was a doctor, but um, she was always my, my mother, and that's where we lived. But that was in 1937. Of course, by 1939, um, I personally had no idea what was going on in Europe, but Hitler had already occupied Austria, There'd already been this uh, dreadful Munich agreement, which Chamberlain attended, where they finally, Hitler said that he wanted to occupy certain parts of uh, the Czech Republic on the border of Germany. And uh, he basically promised that if they could occupy that area of the country, he'd leave the rest alone. So Chamberlain came back and said, great, there's not going to be a war. You know, we've made agreement. But of course, that was all a lie, because on the um, 14th of March, 1939, uh, the Nazis occupied the rest of the country. Do you have any memory of that? I have absolutely no memory of that at all. What I do know, that my father was involved with a very famous German author called Thomas Mann. Back in the 30s, Thomas Mann had written some very un unpleasant anti-Nazi articles and books, and he was expelled from Germany. So in 1939, these two men came to see my father, saying, by tomorrow, Prague will be occupied. Your name is high on the list to be arrested by the Gestapo, and we suggest that you leave. I just know he disappeared. We didn't know... Um, our, our parents never talked about this. My mother, you know, didn't discuss this with us. I was a nine-year-old. My sister was three. And then in May that year, she told us that we were going to go to England. There'd already been a kinder transport in 1938 when 10,000 Austrian and German children had been brought to England, and that was the kinder transport. But in 1939 is when the Germans started, you know, when, when, the, when um, the occupation began and uh, the, the, the Czech Jewish families were beginning to realize how dangerous life was going to be and put their children on the train. On the 31st of um, July, um, I was taken with my sister to the railway station, and my grandfather came with us. And it was there that he gave me my autograph book in which he sent a message, wrote a message. Um, and in the message he said, remember to stay faithful to the country you're leaving, to your grandfather, to your parents, who love you very much. And uh, we were then put on the train. This is, this is the label I actually wore around my neck. And it's got British Committee Child Transport with Fleischmann Milliner. And my number was 641, 641. And my sister's was 639. I can't honestly remember, you know, being on the train, traveling on that train, except uh, I was with my sister. And with us, it was also my two and a half year old little cousin there was also traveling called Helen, whose father had also escaped and he was already in England. He joined the uh, Czech Air Force. So he was waiting for her uh, when, when she got to England. We traveled to Holland uh, en route, although the train stopped. We couldn't get out uh, to buy any food. Uh, we had to have everything with us. But we got to Holland and Holland at that point was still free. And we were met at the station. 
uh, and I know by, you know, a Dutch people who are expecting this train with these children, given, um, I was told, hot chocolate to drink. I was told bananas. My sister said she was sick, but she can't possibly remember because she was three. But and then we were put on this huge ship. Now, none of us had ever seen the sea. Czechoslovakia is right in the centre of Europe. And the biggest thing we saw were would be lakes. However, um, we travelled with the ship to Harwich, where there was another train waiting for us to take us to Liverpool Street Station. And there were the various foster parents waiting to collect the children. Uh, and these parents that had been found by this man called Nicholas Winton. We were met by a couple called, um, well, he, only he came. Uh, we got to know him eventually as Daddy Ratcliffe, he was called Roland Ratcliffe. And he lived in Ashton Underline, a um, small town near Manchester. And Daddy Ratcliffe was the secretary of the local, local Labour Party. And he took us on the train uh, to live with them. And we went to live in 72 Alexandra Street. And this was a, a two-up, two-down terrace house, uh, two bedrooms, bath in the kitchen, loo in the yard, a front room. And we had come from Prague from a, a very modern apartment. But from what I know and from what I remember, it didn't, we didn't seem to mind. And the Radcliffe's had a daughter, a 16-year-old daughter called Mary. And because they didn't want to separate us, because a lot of the children who came, the siblings, were separated from each other. They sent Mary to live with their grandmother so they could uh, have both of us in the, in the bedroom. And uh, they were extremely kind to us. And um, uh, as opposed to people talking about English food, we had absolutely no problem. Mami Ratcliffe was a very good cook. And, you know, you remember things through remembering food. And I remember things like plum pie and uh, Yorkshire pudding with, uh, with um, um, syrup on it. Uh, and I went to the local school, Mosley Road Council School. Um, I got a report somewhere, and I must have been speaking English very quickly. And from photographs of the time, we look very happy. At what point did you begin to understand what had happened to you? All the time when we were small, our parents never talked about it. Now, we knew the war was on, but of course, nobody knew. Well, a few people we, we gather now did know what was going on with concentration camps, but certainly the general public didn't. We didn't. We didn't know that in uh, 1942, when the um, final solution that was known, that was organized, when all the Jewish population was being rounded up and sent to either Terezin or, in my case, in our case, uh, my cousins and my grandparents were sent directly to an extermination camp of which there were many that people don't realize. People know the name of Auschwitz and Belsen but dotted throughout Poland, there were hundreds, and I mean hundreds of extermination camps, and these were small camps where the trains that brought the prisoners, you lasted about a month, and you were still immediately murdered in the gas chambers. And uh, my cousins, who were the same ages, who would have been at the time 15 and 12, very sadly, uh, they, in 1942, with their parents who were taken away and uh, to a concentration camp. And from the documents, they, they lasted just a month before they were killed there. So most of my relations actually died in the camps. Although I came out on the last train, there was another train due to leave. And this train was 
full of over 200 children, and it was due to leave on the 1st of September. And 1st of September, 1939, is when the Germans invaded Poland. War started, and that train never left. And 15,000 Czech and Slovak children died in concentration camps. And from that train, uh, as far as we know, we had news of about four children that had survived, but all the others didn't. And of course, we wouldn't have um, if we hadn't, if my mother hadn't been brave enough to put us on that train. Can you discuss the first time that you were told about the man who had rescued you all those years ago? The first time was when um, I got a phone call at home in the kitchen in 19, uh, um, what would it be, 58, 68, 78, 88? And this woman said, this is Esther Ranson. And uh, I thought somebody was pulling my leg and I just said, I'm the Queen of England. I literally answered it that way. And she said, no, what, what, what was your name before you were Grenfell Baines? And I said, it was Fleischmann. She said, well, I have a, a list in my hand and we found your name on there. And uh, the list comes from a scrapbook which belongs to a man called Nicholas Winton. And we're going to invite Mr. Winton to the television studio and we'd like you to come down to meet him. Uh, we're inviting him, a few of you. I said, yes, certainly. Um, but I still had no idea really what she was, I hadn't taken it in. And when I got to London and we got to the studio, she said, now, we're going to ask this gentleman to come in. We don't want you to tell him who you are. This is to surprise him. Um, but he's the man who organized the trains that uh, you traveled on when you came to England. We were sitting on the front row and there was an empty chair next to us. And uh, she sat naked down there and the program started. And uh, she had this scrapbook with her. And uh, she was saying, now, Mr. Winton, um, uh, these are the pictures of some of the children that uh, uh, you, uh, you brought to England. And uh, here is the list of names. And next to you, that yeah, was on his left, is a woman called Vera. She was called Vera Gissing. And Vera flung her arms around him and said, thank you for saving my life. And I was sitting on his right-hand side. And uh, of course, and then he, she introduced me to him. Uh, and I happened to have, and I was able to tell him that not only I was saved, that my mother was saved. And when Esther Anson said, those of you who came on the train, will you stand up? The entire studio stood up. And there you saw him slightly wiping his eyes. He wasn't an emotional man really at all. If you today go down any street in the Czech Republic and you tell them that you're a Winton child, every person in the country knows his name. When you met him, how did you feel? Well, how do you feel when you meet a man who saves your life? And of course, he became almost a surrogate father, uncle, grandfather to hundreds of these children who by now had been married and had got families. As he said, by then he had a family of over 5,000 children. One of us was living in Tel Aviv and his name was Hugo Marom. And Hugo was visiting Nikki. And he said, you know, Nikki, uh, you're famous. People know about us, but the heroes of all our stories were really the parents who were brave enough to put the children on the trains um, because most of them probably knew they would never see them again. And we should have a memorial to those parents. And Nikki said, and not before time. I have time for one more question, and it's, it's quite a big one. What would you 
most want people to understand about the events of the Holocaust and take from hearing your story and stories like yours? Well, first of all, I think it needs to be repeated. I think the film needs to be shown in schools. And I, I make a point of this personally, and I know there are a few of us who are still alive, who go to schools, who talk to children, who um, uh, Auschwitz should be visited. And I do know that high schools now do have um, Holocaust education and take, take young people uh, to see what happens when something dreadfully goes wrong and uh, a country t and certain people take law into their own hands. What happened in those days must never again be repeated and it must never ever be forgotten. And when the Nazi party uh, came around collecting all the Jews, my aunt who stayed with us looked out and saw what was going on. She couldn't do anything about my mother, who by that time was taken downstairs into the uh, courtyard where they gathered all the Jewish women. 